world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio FreedomSense.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> feel that things were not quite right that everything was just ever so slightly askew do you have to paraphrase morpheus a splinter in your mind if you're interested in hearing the latest information about ufos the paranormal ancient cultures and structures monatomic elements longevity fantastic discoveries in science download it to your brain then tune into us hi i'm dave and i'm mackie and we are Shiny Side Out, Sundays, 2 to 4 a.m. Eastern. See you then. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. All right. Thanks for listening while we take that short break here. At Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. All right, it's just turned four o'clock in the UK. Uh, you're listening to Free Association. My name's Dennis. Uh, I'm here every Saturday afternoon. It's 11 a.m. in the States on the East Coast, I think, and a bit earlier on the West Coast. Um, I don't have any kind of real plan for today. I was going to do a little bit of, I might read some Walter Russell quotes out at some point, um, but I don't really have any kind of, agenda so a little bit of emotional freedom technique maybe a little bit of violet flame but apart from that just musings on life um, i do have karen with me as well though uh karen are you are you around i am how are you i'm good thanks i'm very good uh, it's good how to you? hear your voice yeah it's been a while it's been a while um, thanks for having me on yeah, it's fine, Karen. It's lovely, lovely for you to be here. Um, I've been working for a couple of, actually, three weeks now, and uh, things are starting to get back to normal in Newcastle, in the UK generally as well. Uh, the the local cafes are open now for takeaway. the The coffee shops are open for takeaway, but they're not taking cash at the moment. They're just doing everything on cards. Uh, which makes life a bit complicated if you need change to get on a bus or something. The bus doesn't have a card situation. Yeah, they do. They do, but I don't like them. I haven't got. I haven't got a a card that does um, like touch touch things. It's it's an old school card that you've got to you've got to put it in the machine and tap your pin number on. Oh, I see. So I can't do the contactless thing. Uh, which means that I'm scrambling around for change and I have to keep giving them more than the bus fare, <laughs> which is a bit annoying. So, I, so they now owe me about three quid, three, pound, three pounds in overpayments over the last three weeks, I would imagine. Wow. See, no one... I used to go to Port Authority and just get you know, a pass for a week and that little pass, you just zip it through the bus thing. So I would pay... You know, like when I lived in New York City, I would just buy a pass for the entire month, whatever it cost. And it just, you know, it was kind of like paper card with a magnetic strip. And I would just get on the bus or, you know, the subway and just, whoop, just run the stripe. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got those. We've got those. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm because I'm getting paid monthly now instead of weekly. So I'm trying to budget until my because my first week's wage is next week so i've worked three weeks just on whatever welfare money i could get while we've been in lockdown 
So I'm I'm kind of just pay, paying as I go along, and I'll work it out when I get my first month's wages what I can do. Well, that's good. But I'm glad to hear things are, are becoming more normal now. Are people still wearing masks in that area of the country? Or, I'm yeah. sorry, the world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the masks are compulsory on public transport, which means that uh, the bus drivers now have more authority than they probably should have. <laughs> I've had a couple of uh, conversations with bus drivers over the last week. One, it's actually one, the same driver twice told me to put my mask on and made a point of telling me that the rules include putting it over my nose. That's wow. Did you have a conversation with a bus driver about just their thoughts about what's going on? Because that's interesting you said that because I have experienced that people that work in stores, uh, you know, food stores and stuff, they like, look, I just took this job to be, you know, cashier or to do this. I'm not enforcement and I don't like being in a position where just because I work the cash register that I'm having to tell people to, you know, like, like that's, they, they felt, I guess the word is that they felt out of their comfort zone or that it wasn't, you know, because all of a sudden they're in a position where they're acting like some kind of security enforcement or whatever yeah, and they're yeah. like this this exactly. isn't part of the job description like i just signed up to drive the bus like i wanted to work in transportation or whatever and i was not in i was not signing up for a position where i was telling citizens you need to put a mask on nice try put the mask completely over your nose <laughs> i mean yeah. like that can be uncomfortable for some people. I mean, there's a reason why. They, and I just think that puts them in a very compromising situation. And it's interesting because there's some clerks or, or people that, yeah, like they don't enforce it. And then other ones that do. And the ones that do, because there's not consistency, end up getting, um, what do you call it? Like backup or like, you know, you not backup. Push, push back from, from the public. Yeah, yeah, and so that's perfect for emotional freedom techniques because, um, you know, there's not consistency right now in the world at all. Uh, you can walk into, uh, like here, one 7-Eleven, and they're lax, and you can walk into another 7-Eleven, and I'm sure it's the same with a bus. Like, there might be it one is, bus yeah. driver who's like, put it over your nose, and another one's like, yeah, I'm not yeah. going to die on this yeah, this mostly, <laughs> mostly they don't care that much, but it seems to be normal distribution. I was thinking about it. So you've got at one end, you've got authoritarian bus driver. Then you've got quite a lot of people in the middle who were just like, well, really, you probably should be wearing it over your nose, but I don't really care that much because you're only, you're only on the bus for 10 minutes, so I'm not going to make an issue out of it, which would be my thought process. If I was a bus driver, I think, I don't think I would, well, I don't do confrontation anyway, so the thought of confrontation over something that's a placebo that's making absolutely no difference anyway, I wouldn't bother with it, quite honestly. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got a drivers who really are all right with they're all right with picking up the money. See, on some buses, you can't you can't give the driver uh, change, you can't give the driver money. They're putting it straight into a plastic tub or whatever. And on, and on other buses, the driver will take the money straight from you. So it is, it's totally personal preference at the moment. Okay, so you've done a whole lot of work just in regulating your emotions, coming to a place of peace. You know, you talk about the emotional freedom technique, but like a lot of people haven't done that. And, um, you know, times like this happen and they're like, well, the last, like, these are things that I've heard. Like, well, the, the seven 11, that's just three quarters of a mile further down the road. Doesn't do this. Like basically as a citizen, they're saying you're not being consistent with the same brand that's down the street. And I'm getting irritated because I already took the time to stop here. Why can't you just be like the one that's down the street? And so like I'm seeing like little spats like that. 
Also, um, I think I've told you about the, the glaring look that I got from the one dude that was just like over his mask, like, you are not six foot away from me. Like, <laughs> yeah, like if there was a bubble that popped up over his head, that's what it would have said. It would have been like, back up, girl. <laughs> So I was like, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm not dying on this battlefield. I'm just going to back up, whatever. But um, can emotional freedom technique be used in those, I would call them insta moments, because it's like the irritation or the disruption and flow is happening right now in real time. Yeah, I mean, there's ways to ways to do it it's there's a thing it's in nlp they call it anchoring and i'm not qualified to talk about nlp really but i will anyway uh because i know a little bit about it i did a I did a two-day introduction to nlp course 20 years ago and decided i was already doing most of what they were teaching me so i didn't want to pay two thousand pounds for the full course well, what is it called lp nlp neuro linguistic programming Oh, neuro-linguistic programming. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, so, come on. Everybody can embark on self-study. I mean, even uh, Goodwill Hunting said, oh, you're going to find out that you paid uh, $600,000 for an education that you could have paid for $1.25 in late fees at the Essen Library. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of that about. But one of the things that they talk about in NLP is anchoring. So it's just associating a physical thing with, with a, a state of mind, basically. So if you think about what, what emotional freedom technique does, the tapping is anchoring. So you can- That's true. So all you need to, all you need to do is, is if, you, if, you, if you feel like you're gonna get into a situation where you're gonna shout at somebody or whatever, just anchor, anchor joy and peace before you go out. Just tap and, and get in. Find a way of getting into a, a, a memory or a state or whatever word you want to use. Just just remember something that was joyful for you and tap on the side of your hand before you go out into the world that's full of chaos and confusion and, and angst and all that. And then if you do come across something that, that gets you a bit wound up, you can just tap and get back into that state that you had before you left the house. Uh, I, would, I would imagine so that. then but, it's... Okay, so it's preparing ahead of time. And when you do the tapping out and about, then it brings you back to the initial state of calm and joy that you created before you even started interacting with a bunch of idiots. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm texting you. Cause I, I, I don't want to call them idiots. That's not nice. Just people that are anxious and afraid and acting out of their fear nobody's an idiot i'm just saying you know so that's interesting now okay so let me explain something that i do that's similar and tell me if you see any comparisons or connections between the two one of the things ever since i did the whole alan watts meditating thing and for the first time of all the times I ever tried it, I successfully got into a meditative state via entering sound. And I often will close my eyes, take three deep cleansing breaths, and I think about, you know, taking in clean energy and exhaling energy that no longer serves me. Clean exit toxin, clean exit toxin. And then I focus on three things while my eyes are closed of things I can actually sense. And I really like using sound, but so I hear the fan running. I heard a car drive by. I feel my cat next to my lap. And it's just picking out three things. And then when I open my eyes, I'm more like a neutral state. I wouldn't say that it's doing any work to, um, because some of the emotional freedom stuff that I looked at that uh, you recommend and have played and things, I see that you can actually like get over deeply embedded fears, like fears of like finances or this, that, and the other thing. 
But the thing that I was just describing is more or less to get you in neutral so that in the moment, because there's a thing, like when you're in the moment and something strikes you, it can go from hot to heavy to like full out crisis in a matter of like a minute, depending on how other people in your environment may interact or respond with you. And so like getting to neutral is really important and helpful for me before I begin to even um, discern, uh, not discern, but to, and sometimes I don't catch myself soon enough, to be quite frankly. I mean, to be quite honest, I, I don't catch, catch myself honestly, but getting in neutral is like the first step for me to then be like, okay, this is agitating me enough that I, I need to do emotional freedom technique, whatever. What are your thoughts? I mean, is there any similarity between? Yeah, I mean, you've got to, you, you can, again, the toughen can take you to neutral as well. Uh, my, my thought would be, um, if you're trying to get, if you, if you're trying to get to joy and you're so distracted, you only get halfway, at least you got to neutral. Do you know what I mean? So if you've already, if you've already anchored a place of joy and peace, then you get knocked sideways a little bit. At least the tapping will get you some of the way back there. Whereas if you if you're trying to get to neutral, and you only get halfway, you could still end up having a row with somebody. Okay, you can still get in a row with somebody if you go to neutral. But you, you okay? I see what you're saying. So really, the better practice is to before you go out and about, anchor yourself. Well, and then when you're doing the tapping, then you're not just going to neutral, but, but it's helping you get back to a state of zen or zero or whatever you want to call peace or whatever. Yeah. A, a, a I see. Place. So I haven't tested this. This is just completely off the top of my head. But I will test it because I'm going to bump into this bus driver again at least twice a week, probably for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Until I until I sort out the situation, because that's just the way my my life is. So I know, I know what route he's on, and I know what time he's he's going to go past. So I can either avoid his bus, or I can find a way to deal with it that isn't a confrontation and doesn't end up with him give, lecturing me about the the joys of wearing masks every single time. <laughs> the <laughs> joys of wearing. <laughs> well, Doc Time is in the chat room. He is awake on west coast of the united states and he asks so you should be tapping to the highest goal uh, good well question it is a good question i mean you, you can start by tapping towards neutral uh but for me if, if you're aiming if you're aiming for joy you're aiming for union with the divine or whatever whatever thing you're aiming for you might as well aim for the highest um and there's a well, I'm 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 going to confuse a couple of techniques here, but it's a but there's a there's a guy called Lester Levinson who who came who came up with a thing called Sedona method. And what one of the things that he says uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of free audios on archive.org of Lester Levinson, so you don't have to pay for anything. You can get most of it for free. Um, but one of the things that he says with Sedona method is get high, go high to release. So aim for the joy. And then if you've got trauma to release, the trauma will be much easier to release from, from being high up. If you're aiming for, if you're aiming for kind of bliss, then uh, the trauma looks really small from a place of bliss. So it's manageable as opposed to being in a place that's neutral where a trauma might look larger and might be more difficult to get your head around and it might look like it's more difficult to let go of. Wow, this is amazing. So does that make sense? can you yeah, it totally does. I put in the chat for anybody that's wanting to participate in the chat, you can go to freedomslips.com. There's a live chat going on. 
with questions, communicators. I wrote Lester Levinson's Sedona Method, free resources. Uh, just Google and look at videos or whatever. Go, and then I put go high. He says, go high to release. What, okay, what, explain high. What What does that mean, that you're in well, is it the same? Those Zen space with like no action of restless thoughts? Is that like, it, if yeah. you could define high? Right, okay, there's that within. So I'm going to use a, a hierarchy of emotion from Sedona method, but it applies equally to emotional freedom technique. I use the, I use the hierarchy from one and I tap and I, I go through it. So the. The hierarchy of emotions is ag flap, which is apathy, grief, uh, lust, no, no, apathy, grief, fear, lust, anger, pride. That's ag flap. And then it's courage, acceptance, peace at the top of that hierarchy. So you're going, you're going for the top three, really. If you go for courage, acceptance, and peace, then letting go of anger and letting go of lust or desire or whatever, or letting go of, of trauma or from wherever. If you're going for the top three, then the high, if you go for the high level emotions, then the, the, the heavier emotions at the bottom are easier to let go of because they're smaller. I don't know, this is just from my experiences and my words, but within their hierarchy. So, if I go for courage, if I'm tackling something that I've been avoiding, I would go for courage and acceptance. And then and then the thing that I've been avoiding becomes a small thing at the bottom of the hierarchy in the in the kind of um, in the in the grief, anger, lust kind of area, whatever that is, desire. You know what? I think that's critical what you just said because a lot avoidance is one of the several different coping mechanisms for me I think you and I are alike in that we both cope with avoidance uh you, you know I like you like I don't want to see or I'll avoid confrontation however if you box me in a corner I will put the boxing gloves on and you know that kind of thing but avoidance it's interesting that you, on the opposite end of that, is that you want to manifest and get into a state of courage and acceptance. So it's like courage and acceptance is the recipe to, I don't know if the right word is, mutate or like diminish avoidance. Yeah, for, for me, that seems to be the way it works. Uh, doc, that makes doc, sense. Doc. Yeah, Doc Times put in a a, a link in a, a, a note in chat saying David Hawkins' book Power v Force, which has a, a hierarchy of emotional states. He got that he got quite a lot of that hierarchy from Sedona method, but I think some of it is is doused as well. So David Hawkins is is very much a Sedona method man. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for that resource, Doc. Um, again, the name of that book is Power versus Force. By David Hawkins. That's a that's interesting. So hmm. the, I found the, the two the two things, emotional freedom technique and Sedona method, are complementary to each other. They, yes. They, they very much complement each other because they've got the same kind of assumption that you can let go of something is, is I, the key part. Yes. Well, and here's here's the thing. I um this is what I've noticed in my professional time is that there is no one size fits all and there's no one size fits every moment. And that whole like thing that you're doing, like blending, that, that's good because what you're doing is you are, as Dr. Lenny would say, you are operating at human scale. You're blending what you need for the person and the moment that it's needed. And so, and this is the purpose. Like, you don't have to 
say, oh, well, I'm all emotional freedom and ignore all. I mean, it would be a disservice to ignore all the other techniques. It's the blending of those techniques that allows you to fit the tool, if you will, you know, the healing tool to the individual person. And I find that that blending them to meet the needs of the person based on because you know people are complex they have different varying levels of intensities they have different defense mechanisms they have predominant defense defense mechanisms that um and then they have secondary or tertiary ones those kinds of things and so what works for one may not work for all so balancing and mixing these healing i i think it's it's all based up to the individual and what feels useful for them yeah, Does that and, make and, sense? yeah, and sometimes, sometimes when I can't quite get at something with Reiki or whatever, then it one of the other techniques will get there. I mean, it might, it might, right? Be, so if, if I'm struggling to get get to a place where I'm letting go of something or cutting through something, you've got to approach it from four or five different angles to find out which is the angle with the the path of least resistance, if you like. Yes, but also turning inward. Bonnie always says this because I was struggling with that about a month or so ago. And she said, whenever I'm not sure, I don't know, I turn inward and just let my higher spirit. And usually like something while she's sitting in quiet will scroll through her mind or a thought or something. Like she'll get a nudge. And that nudge is what takes her to what she needs but yes trial and error works too that's what i usually do too um but i liked how she also gave me the option of you know learn to to turn inward and depend on your internal stimulus as opposed to uh external validations and it's a balance i like anything else in life i don't think you should steadfastly say oh all this all that i don't fanaticism all this or all that it's not balanced it's not to me it's not natural so um trial and error as well as another option is turning inward and if if you are truly able to empty out your restless thoughts and be in that state of uh still then you very well could get probes or whatnot of suggestions you'll you'll get inspiration and uh, the thing with the thing with techniques is is they they're very I, I do rely on the on the techniques quite a lot because I just I like them and I've been doing them for so long that they're just part of me now. But uh, I but I'll, I the thing the thing one of the things is that that I've discovered is that I I love Jungian psychology. I like the ideas. I like the principles. I like the way it's expressed. But I went to a Jungian psychology uh, meeting of uh, Jungian psychologists when I was when? in the, oh, this when? Oh, when? This was years ago, and they were all they were all very, very, very dry. There was nothing lived about what they were doing. So my version is the lived version. I'm doing this kind of hero's journey thing, working with archetypes, playing playing with energies, mixing and matching as I go along. There was none of that in the Jungian psychology meeting that I went to. Well, and that was probably because it was isolated to just Jungian. Yeah, I think so. Whereas I, I was, I've been using tarot cards and astrology, so I'm used to playing with archetypes from three different directions, if you know. know but I mean? isn't that natural for the universe? I mean, just when I think of biodynamic farming that uh, Bridget talks about, and everything that I've learned from Doc Lenny is that there's a natural ecosystem and it's important to have a blend of everything in one, what, how many ever square footage area, because they all, it's a cycle of life. They all give riches and what's depleted or what's waste can be mutated into something beautiful. And, and instead of having all of everything like auto assembly line, 
in one 100 square foot area and a second 100 square foot area having another item it like the natural way of life is to blend and borrow it, oh you, you need i mean it's like go fish do you have any twos <laughs> you know it's just like that's the natural i think that's how we naturally balance i would love to hear doc times thought on that um yeah, I can, I can bring Lenny in. Let's see if, if, if he's, he wants to. I mean, he got up. I mean, little West Coaster, he's he's up early. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can uh, do this technical thing that I need to do to bring him in and see if he's around. Sure. Should I, should I, I forgot the screen share. I don't know whether that makes a difference to anything, but normally, no. I, screen, normally I screen share what I didn't to do. Here, let's see if we can get Lenny. I don't normally put the put the trailers on either. I normally start start my recording afterwards. Hi, Lenny, are you around? I am here now. Yes. All right. Excellent. So, Dr. Lenny, I was interested to see if you could weigh in. We were talking about blending different. Uh, theoretical frameworks and techniques for healing and um, I've always taught my students that blending is good it should be blended to like you say to meet human scale and then I'm reminded of biodynamic farming and how um, it's important to have all the different varieties of uh, land life or whatever within square footage because they all lend and borrow and uh, recycle waste and stuff and it's it's balanced in a way and I wondered if what your thoughts were if that was mirrored in these kind of what do you want to say philosophical social sciences I think that it really does fit that the individual has his own unique pathway and that the According to Fibonacci sequence, we get like a 60-40 breakdown of a major pathway and a minor pathway. But you always have the option of your own unique pathway. And when we're given these choices of one thing or another by the system, we're not given that unique path. We have to align ourselves in either the 60 or the 40. And in fact, if we we're allowed to take the best parts of each portion, we would find harmony and be able to solve the problem of duality. But in essence, the system wants you to follow what they told you the way they told you. And those of us who want to blend our wires and come up with the, the pathway to do things have to struggle against the way that conformity works to insist on behaviors. So I think that it's real important for individuals working on human scale to be able to evaluate anything they're given in context to what they already know. And instead of rejecting what you know and taking the new information in, why don't you just suspend what you know, take the new information in, evaluate it against the judgment system you've already built, and then run with it. And if we all did this on personal scale, maybe there wouldn't be need for police forces and governments. I concur. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that as well. If, if you could, if, if you manage to to blend opposite ends of the scale and 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 not have your head explode, then I reckon you at that point you're capable of having a human conversation with just about anybody on the planet. So yes, I think you can suspend your own belief long enough to listen and get the other belief to a point of understanding, and then open yourself back up and it will be easier to see the contrasting differences that you have to make your individual choice of. It's interesting you said that, Dennis, because you, me, and Lenny are three people who I believe we literally 
can have conversations with anybody. Yeah, absolutely. 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 I, I mean, I remember my 30th birthday party and my friend Karen said, this is the most eclectic group of people I've ever seen. <laughs> like ever at a party, like wide age range, like, like all different professions, all like all different. And, and I go, really? I'm like, is that bad? She's like, I take it as a compliment. Like, because I didn't know. I was just like, these are my friends. Like, this is just like, I would love for you to hang out with me, whatever. And, um, and I see the same in you. I love your tales about, like, your best friend is 92 years old. Like, and, and Lenny's very much the same way. And so maybe there's something in what Lenny just said um, in that we are able to suspend what we believe or know and open our mind to consider and then later evaluate or weigh it new way weigh it to see if it fits in and and just because I take time to stop and listen um and understand doesn't mean I have to agree right pretty much so one one of of the people I have coffee with on a regular basis is a a young guy He's, he's 22 or 23 I think and he's a fascist he's very much into like Europe European Italian pre war fascism um, and I'm not, that's not my belief system. It's not the way that I approach the world, but, but within, within European fascism, it turns out there's some hermetic mysticism in there. So I can connect with it from that angle. And I'm, I'm, and look, look at the, and I, I listen to the people that he, that he quotes and the, like the, the books that he, that he recommends me read. I, I bought one of them, which was the, the hermetic one the others i'm not really all that bothered about but if there's that that's my way into to italian fascism it's my way into having a conversation with adam um because he's interested in the occult he's interested in in alistair crowley and the the occult and 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 in fascism Uh, so i can join him in one or two out of the three things that we talk about quite happily uh, I'm I'm not ever going to be a fascist, but I but I can I can get myself to a place where I can I can look at the belief system and look at the the connections between things and the way somebody would see the world from that position. Has he can... ever struck a chord though with you? Just exploring curiosity. Uh, at, when you reflect on your time with him, has he ever struck a chord with you where you felt like you needed to do emotional freedom tapping or something? Uh, no, we've never, we've never conflict. We've never had a conflict in all the, in the three, four years that I've known him. Three years. Well, not years. conflict, but has he ever said or said anything or expressed something that you were in? Well, I reject that. I'm not going to say it outright, but you know, in my internally in my head, I don't agree with that. Um, I'm just going to kind of put that up on the shelf and just continue to listen. Like uh, I, I've, I found that that uh, some sometimes what I'm saying is like, okay, you talked about earlier like anchoring, and anchoring that's something I do before every person, and that's something I learned how to do in my profession to anchor myself and put myself on a clean slate. And I forget my values, my beliefs, and just go in, listen to a person, let them present their stuff. But then, you know, during like regular free time or whatever, I would interact with people that maybe had very different values. And I talk and I listen to them, but sometimes they say something that like I outright reject. Um, like, for example, uh, I was helping um, a neighbor of mine from Saudi Arabia who was having a difficult time learning English. I was accompanying her, helping her get around town, this, that, the other thing. And she was really excited about what she got done with her hair. But um, she was ex- cool with, like, a photo, but um, didn't want the photo shared or whatever with anybody because she could get in trouble from her government and of course I respect that or whatever but I had a hard time like wrapping my head around like 
why would you get in trouble like for photographing like you're in a different country that has different customs but you're concerned that this picture may somehow it's not that I didn't reject her or anything like that I didn't want to argue with her I just I had to put that aside like on the shelf and say I'll integrate this into my psyche later because I want to respect her I do respect her she's adorable and um I just but it didn't resonate with me right away so I just I just kind of like oh okay and I just put it on a shelf for later right yeah without them the the belief system he's got is that is that the world is going around in circles and it'll never improve. So it's, it's, it's there's like a circular model there, whereas mine is a spiral. Uh, my belief system is that the world is slowly moving kind of through a spiral, and Adam's belief is that it's a cir- it's a circular motion. There's no there's no extra dimension there. So that I have to put to one side, but apart from that, we're, we're, and that's quite a foundational thing. That's a fundamental philosophical disagreement right there. But it, but it's, at the same time, all it is is it's a missing one dimension. So once he gets, to, he's only and he's only twenty three. So at some point, he might get to a place where he adds in the the, the extra dimension of time and, and growth. And then he's got a spiral, so it's only a matter of where where he is in his in his reading and his thought process and whatever. Does that make sense? It's interesting. It's interesting to see how younger people think, and it's a a lot different from the way I was taught to think. And so there's some basic foundations that I think that people don't quite work on the same page with, but if you open your book and you listen to what they're saying the the strands that ring true to everybody come through when you have different perspectives agreeing in something that they got to in different ways and that becomes totally edifying in that you you can tell you're right now because somebody else came up with it without basing it on your view of thought but a lot of what we're taught now as the basis of what we believe isn't really true or correct in the sense of what we know now and addressing the breakdowns of where things don't work the way they used to is probably one of the best ways that we have new ways of analyzing the situation and solving problems instead of creating them. Yeah, it's tricky because you, if you prod something, then you, you're potentially going to disrupt a whole lot of other things around it. That's that's my main issue. That's why that's well one of my main issues. It's like I don't I don't prod things too hard because because it, it tends to disrupt a whole lot of things. Yeah, when do you know when to prod? Um, for for me, so this is interesting for me. The prodding comes when it's hit like an emotional sensitivity chip that it's like reject reject or you know like there's something that it's it it just hits that level and how do i you and that comes down to regulating emotions maybe anchoring yourself but how do you but isn't there some pushing back that is needed for us to evolve well um from my from my perspective at the moment, I'm I'm doing a whole imagination creates reality thing. That's my foundational assumption for at least the next year or so. And so, in theory, with that assumption, there, there's no requirement for pushback because you can you can imagine yourself in a different state of consciousness. And if you do that, you know, uh, do you get what I'm saying? I do. You know? And you know what that comes down to is the internal versus external self. When you start within compared to pushing back to change what's external to you, focus within. Go ahead, Doc. I find that 
what Dennis just said is very, very right on and in agreement with Walter Russell. And Walter Russell in his Universal One started with the premise that mind is everything and then proceeded to derive physics and chemistry from there and yet is not really taught in schools at all because the information he provided is counter to the current. But Russell was quite the philosopher when you start reading and a very religious man who went into the concept of the universal one so deep that uh, he sat down and wrote it in like 40 days, I believe, was the story. But Dennis had mentioned Walter Russell earlier, and I wanted to come back to him. How much Walter Russell have you read, Dennis? I've, I've literally just bought the, 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 the Power of One, or whatever the book's called. Universal One. Universal One, that's it. I've literally just bought it this week. But I've been listening to odd bits and pieces. Um, I listened to a little bit of an audio book. So, but, and it, a lot of it is it's like it's very parallel to to the Hindu structure of how things work. I'm kind I'm kind of seeing seeing a lot of parallels with it. And plus, I was already at a place where where I'm, I'm thinking the universe is electric. The primary thing is electricity, and he that's one of the things that he says. Yes, and uh, he went into electricity and magnetism pretty deep. And uh, the forces that we've been given by physics might not be the forces that were actually given by nature. And so we've now got two different beliefs to correlate that don't quite work the same, but have to have similar patterns where the actual way that things work is not a blend of 60% nature, 40% human. It's a uh, 100% nature, and human is guessing at how things could be. So at human scale, what we, what we can do is learn from nature and be human and make our best educated guesses and watch at how these things work and I think that investigating people like Walter Russell and Royal Rife, uh, Wilhelm Steiner, Linus Pauling, people from past ages that did significant work would give us a second option on what we think we know that we've learned in school because that's the information base that really falls into question. And right now, people are so busy putting on their masks and lining up in their bread lines that there's not, not people working to change how things work because they're too busy trying to keep the system going so they're not destitute. But I think as soon as we let go of the system, nobody will be destitute that we'll all figure out how to work with each other to make sure what's important to human survival is met, not this global parasitic scale that we seem to be on. But I do want to point out also that today is the solstice and uh, wish you all a happy summer. And uh, in terms of uh, astrology, pretty busy day here on on solstice day so yeah can you, yeah can you Sorry, guys expand ahead. on that i that's not my wheelhouse so can you both or one or the other expand on what happens on a solstice well one of the things that happens is uh is the sun is entering the, the zodiacal sign of, of cancer so it's it's moving into a water sign, uh, which uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to explain. But one of uh, the the three key important things in a in an astrological chart would be a sun sign, moon sign, and rising sign. So there's three. There's a lot more to it than that. But but uh, the sun sign, moon sign, and rising sign can all be different elements. 
Uh, and if you if the sun moves into a, a water sign and you've got a lot of uh, stuff in water elements in your chart, it'll it'll resonate and it'll it's like an electrical signal. I'm, I'm making this up and the language is wrong, but it's like oh. it's like an electrical signal to those bits of the chart. I see what you're saying. So depending on what your key signs are on a solstice, when you, whatever your key signs are interacts with the energy of the solstice will determine whether or not it will be, you know, on a scale of one to five, like minimal changes or, you know, or, uh, you know, big energetical like energy type charges yeah. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then you've got the other planets can be in earth, water, air, or fire signs as well. So different parts of the chart resonate, like all the, all the fire signs res kind of resonate together, all the water signs resonate together. So any activity in one water sign is going to affect, but they all affect each other anyway, but they kind of, they make a, a more um, more direct connection. So in essence, the air, earth, water, and fire signs work like houses at Hogwarts and Harry Potter books, where each one is a different group of people that are on a different wave frequency, but they're all in resonance with each other, and the four have to be blended, or maybe there's a fifth if we believe in a fifth element. Uh, interesting. The solstice also marks the day when the sun is furthest north here. And uh, the, it's the longest day of the year for light. And then the sun will start moving back towards the south until it reaches the southern point at the winter solstice. So the solstices are one point and the equinoxes are the halfway point. Yeah, and I was I was born on the on the autumn equinox, so it's it's a key point for me because it's my birthday. <laughs> but it, it's also it used to be um, there used to be a thing in Greece uh, where there was a, a festival on the spring equinox and a festival on the autumn equinox, the fall equinox, uh, which was a it a, it was a sea, like a thing to mark the seasons. But it was it was done as mythology and done as initiation rituals and things like that. So they were using using the, the symbols of the sky to mark the seasons on the earth. And by doing this kind of drama dramatic reconstruction, they were putting it into people's consciousness in a different way. So there's three different things going on there. There's like earth, sky, and human. At the same time, say, trying to say the same thing, but in very different ways. I've started to ramble now. Any thoughts? No, you're not rambling at all. I, um, I, I, this is an area that I need to do more research and information. But in general, like I got a download as you and Doc were talking, and I... I kind of understand the significance now. Uh, basically, the solstice is a time where there will be energetical or like synergistic or energy ch changes. And depending on your makeup with, yeah, it, that just the solstice is a time where things, and it, it can change. It, it might be barely noticeable or it could be very noticeable. It just depends on your uniqueness. Again, human scale. Solstice is going to be different for everybody, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not necessarily. It might fall into four sets, the air, earth, fire, and water sets. But within that, each individual is a subset of, of the signal that they get. Interestingly as well, I've, I've, I've not marked the summer solstice at, at Stonehenge, where I did mark, oh, that's the wrong way around. I haven't marked the winter solstice of Stonehenge, where I did mark the summer solstice a few years ago, when I had absolutely no money at all in my pocket. I had just enough to get me a one-way ticket to to Salisbury from London, 
and I didn't have the bus fare to get from Salisbury to Stonehenge, so I had to, I had, I had a one-way ticket to Stonehenge and I had to walk back, and it's like 13 miles or something. So you at, at Stonehenge at the, at the midsummer they do a there's like a druid festival. There's, they let people into that into actually sit on the stones to be around the stones where you, you can't normally, and there's there's a a fire ceremony at uh, at sunrise. So I did did this did this kind of uh, half baked uh, get to Stonehenge and worry about getting home afterwards, uh, and managed to, I managed to do it without getting caught on the train. So that was quite a good thing. But it, it did take me take me quite a long time to walk thirteen miles from Stonehenge to Salisbury. It's not a it's not a journey I'll forget in a hurry. Wow. Kudos to you. I, I love how you just, you literally live life. That is so cool. Oh, that was a while it's ago. I I'm not sure I would do that now, but 15, 20 years ago, I used to do that sort of stuff quite a lot. Well, I notice we're getting to the top of the hour. Thank you for bringing me in on the conversation. No worries at all. Do you want to tell people where they can find you online? Because I know you've got a, a fairly active blog still. Yeah, I've got a site on minds.com under the Mad Doctor Time. And uh, I will post the URL in the chat box. And time is spelled T-H-Y-M-E. And Karen, is there anywhere we can find you online? Have you got anything you you do yeah. that you want to promote? No, just your healing thoughts and vibes are appreciated because I'm going to fix this deficient mitral valve structure that I inherited on the paternal side of my family. So I am just focusing on wellness and oh. uh, I, I hope to be more social coming up but uh yeah but thank you and, and i appreciate everybody's like positive thoughts and outreach i appreciate you all very much no worries at all well I've, we've just got time for me to promote my my blog as well which is free association radio show.com um which is mostly just videos that i watch sometimes videos that i make i post there as well it's just bits and pieces i go backwards and forwards between healing and personal development and psychotherapy and um the occult and um all sorts of all sorts of things but um it has to be 11 o'clock Radio. Many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! The future is uncertain, I know this. Death is inevitable, I know this. But one thing is certain, as free men, it is our right to live unencumbered and in peace. <laughs>